Welcome to the Mysterious Domain Movie Palace. It's December was Barbara Steele month because her birthday is in December. May is Christopher Lee's month because he's born in May. And there's a little funny detail about Christopher Lee's birthday, which is the 27th of May. Peter Cushing's birthday is the 26th of May. So they were actually kind of like twins, weren't they? <laughs> uh, so, in honor of May being Christopher Steele, Christopher Steele, I was gonna say Christopher Steele. <laughs> oh no. Uh, in honor of May being Christopher Lee month, I'm gonna warm you up in April with his very first film appearance in a movie. 1948's The Corridor of Mirrors. So we're going back to the 1940s again, to those beautiful, glamorous, romantic films. And in fact, you will see in this film many shades of Cocteau's La Belle et la Bête. It was filmed in France, and it's full of that style. The music is by Georges Auric, who did the music for La Belle et la Bête. He also did the music for Queen of Spades, which got taken down. Ugh, tragedy. <laughs> um, so there's a nice article I found about this film online, and I will put a link to it in the description. And it says everything that I feel about this film. It, it evokes um, that sense of our eternal return. It's about a romantic obsession. It's about delusion. It's about um, madness. And a man who believes that he's known this lady before. And you know what's interesting about these 1940s films, if, especially if you look at uh, Shanghai Gesture and this movie and the Secret Beyond the Door, these ones, there's, there's what that across the crowded room kind of romance that a lot of us boomers grew up with and were warned against. Stay away from that across the crowded room. But that was actually a very strong kind of connection thing that happened when I was young. Now, The Corridor of Mirrors is based on a book by Chris Massey called The Corridor of Mirrors. And it was discovered by Idana Romney. Donna Romney was born in South Africa. She moved to Britain and she found this book and wanted desperately to make it into a film. So she enlisted the assistance of Rudolf Cartier, who was a very famous Austrian screenwriter. And they collaborated together to write a screenplay of this book with the idea that she would be the star. When they produced it, she would be the star, which I totally get. I would want to be the star, too, in that movie. I, I think it's just one of those kind of stories that just, for me, it's got that La Belle et La Bête. It's got, like, Bluebeard's Castle. It's got, you know, the kind of Freudian uh, mirrors and the kind of repetition and the reflections back and forth. And, you know, our leading lady is a little bit of a narcissist, so she... It's her vanity, right? It carries her along in this. It's, you know, it's got a Pygmalion. It's even got a little bit of Dracula about it. It's also got some of the things from our lovely Barbara Steele films, the, that kind of Helga Linné role, that shadowy housekeeper figure that sort of creates a, a triangulated situation. It's got that too. It was directed by Terence Young. Terence, Terence Young was of Irish descent, but he was born in, guess where? Shanghai, China. Gee, where have we seen that before? If you've been following my channel, we just saw the Shanghai gesture. So this is his directorial debuts. Terence Young's first movie and Christopher Lee's first movie. And believe me, when you see Christopher Lee, he is so young. He looks a little bit like James Stewart too. 
and he's just you know very very poised and you know that you know they put him in there so he get experience in a film and you know it's his it, you know it's getting you ready for his birthday month so Terrence Young had directed uh, Dr. No and From Russia with Love and Thunderbolt he also directed Audrey Hepburn and Sorry Wrong Number which is a pretty good thriller and some Charles Bronson films he, and he filmed in 1948, The Corridor of Mirrors in France. It was a highly acclaimed film. It was very successful. It took seven years for them to get it made, though. So Rudolf Cartier and Edna Romney shopped this around to many production companies. Some of them were interested, but they didn't want to cast her. But this was her baby, and she was going to be in it. And that was the whole motivation for her to do all this. They finally got the funding in 1947 and created a reel to try to attract a leading man in a very, you know, beastly, blue-beardy part. And they attracted uh, a man who was a matinee idol at the time in Britain, Eric Portperson. I, I mean, Eric Portman. And he had been known uh, on the stage, of course, you know, most of these actors at this time were stage actors, but he was in some war films and he kind of played, you know, the blonde German person of World War II in a film called The 49th Parallel. And that was a big hit for him. And he's really good in this. He's so subtle. So you don't even realize where he's taking you and you begin to really feel feel him. It's the kind of thing you want to watch a few times just to get in that sort of space where he, where this character arc is, it's very, uh, like I say, it's delicate, it's subtle, but then, you know, you're like, oh my God, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's got this romantic fantasy about his past life and everything. And then there's a big eyes wide shut type party. So, Miss um, Idana Romney, whose name is Mithanwi. Now, Mithanwi is a Welsh name, and it's really hard to hear. They, they have very thick English accents in this, and they speak quite quickly. I will try to make sure this caption's on if I can, if I can do it. But I'll also put the volume up. So, her name is Mithanwi Conway. And, you know, when you just hear that, like, to hear that on a film, it's Mithanwi Conway, it's... You can you you can what the hell did he say? Well, they're saying her name, Fanley. Thought I'd clue you in to be aware of that. Swans around in these gowns, and there's a whole fantasy built up. Like they live in this mansion and this castle and this living out this fantasy. And then in the in the blue stairs is Barbara Mullen who plays Veronica. And she's that Helga Linne character that, you know, you don't see her, but she's always there. And she's really good. She was started on the stage in Boston when she was three years old. This woman had quite a theatrical career, and she became kind of a staple of a British television show, Dr. Finlay's case book, and she played a housekeeper in that. There's also a cabaret singer called Caroline, played by Joan Maud. She seems to be really well known in Britain. She's really interesting. She's got a combination of kind of uh, glamorous beauty and trashiness that <laughs> makes her, you know, so it's, it's perfect for this role, you know, where she aspires to our leading man, but she gets the dance hall <laughs> you know what i mean it's it's really she's really good so it's time to get swept away by christopher lee's first film ushering us into christopher lee month of may and i hope you enjoy the corridor of mirrors
Rambler? Nothing. That bad dream again? Sorry, I wasn't killed. Wake up, Madame. You're going to miss your train. You've been awake for hours. Terrible children of yours have been absent for ages. Well, they can't. You've got to hide. Oh. Stop pretending. We thought that was a nice new thing. We want you to buy us in London. Yes, we can. Wendell. Wake me. What's the matter, David? Mummy will be home again tomorrow. Yes, London's very big, Mummy. Yes, it is. It has millions and millions of people. Will you get lost, Mummy? Mummies don't get lost, David. Then why did you cry when the postman brought that telegram? <laughs> what you mean, as they say. It means, my good woman, that I can see you from where I am, and that whatever it is you're thinking, you're up to no good. You really want to know what I was thinking? I was thinking that first you haven't kissed me good morning, and second, that I have the best husband in the world for me. Well, as for the first, good morning. And as for the second, I'm very flattered, though I never did think very much of your taste in men. There's a tunnel coming. How highly respectable they think I am. And I'm happy. I, with my beautiful home, perfect husband, and wonderful children. How shocked they'd be if they knew the secret of my visit to London. I'm going to see my lover. Yes. I'm going to see my lover. But I must go. Those dreadful letters coming more and more frequently, threatening to break up my home. If only I could tell my husband. No, he wouldn't understand. I wouldn't want him to.
Walters Frederick, executed for the murder of Mr. Thompson, whose wife had been his sweetheart. See number nine. Nine. Thompson, Mrs. Executed in 1923 for the complicity in the murder of her husband, who was actually killed in her presence by her lover, a young man named Bar Walters. 4445. Death of Marie Antoinette and her husband. Poor things. 46. Carrier, G. 1756 to 1794. Death Ed. One of the French revolutionists, he ordered over a thousand persons to be found in the law. He was guillotined by order of Robespierre. 47, Robespierre. Revolution. You feel above the cutthroats and murderers surrounding you, don't you? I know that look so well. That look of utter boredom. I had it the first time I saw you. I wanted to know all about you. I wanted to know everything. Still hear the tune they played. The song the red-headed girl was singing. Seven years ago. A tinkling piano in the next apartment. Those tumbling words that told you what my heart meant. Anybody interesting here tonight, Jack? One or two people you might find interesting, sir. These foolish things remind me of you. Conquered me when you did that to me. I knew somehow that it had to be. The winds of March make my heart a dancer. A telephone would ring, but who's to answer? Oh, how the ghost of you. Part of the phrase I should have chosen. Can't understand why actors don't change their costumes before coming to a place like this. First bit of real man I've seen tonight. I wonder who he is. Paul Manga, painter, art critic, connoisseur. And who are we all pulling to pieces this time? Take a look. Standing in the entrance, Lord Byron. I'd say it was Sir Walter Raleigh, complete with cloak. No, Hamlet. Good night, sweet prince, as far as I'm concerned. Jack, I shan't be staying. My hat and stick. Oh, how the ghost of you cleans these foolish things. Remind me of you. Would you ask him to play a waltz? If that's what she'd like. Don't stare, darling. Remember what Mother taught you. Blush and turn away.
closer, ladies and gentlemen. Come closer. Yes? The lady is alive. See the gentle rise and fall. Uh -huh. That's sixpence extra. The lady suffers from a rare disease. See the glaze look in her eyes. They're looking at what? The curtains, ladies and gentlemen. The curtains. Are you a fool? Give me a cigarette, someone. Well, if the vigil's on for another night, I suggest we order another bottle of what the management of the small laughingly described as Pontiac. Well, we may as well go on to the Sutherlands now. We don't want to be too late. Of course not. Yes, Lord. 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 Yes, Lord.
you wait, Mortimer. There's no key. The Florentines lack mechanical gadgets. Come along. As we came in, I could feel somehow that he was watching me. And even now, after all these years, I can still remember this house of his in Regent's Park. Perhaps if I could see it today, it would seem much smaller and much more ordinary. And everywhere the scent of flowers, so strong, so sickly sweet, that I felt almost suffocated. I should not do, unless you feel the inclination. Oh, I feel the inclination. You've no idea how much. <laughs> it was then, for the first time, I was to learn of the strange effect laughter had on Paul Mangan. How do you like this room? Highly effective. Thank you. I never quite thought of it like that. Oh, how intriguing. What's that? A little scent bottle. Must be very old. It is. But the scent is still there. The scent of an age to which you really belong. Smells of musk and thyme and amber. Juliet might have used it. Not Juliet, but the Borgias, with their lusts and passions and murder. I'm glad you like the little scent bottle. It happens to be one of the most lovely things in the house. You've got very good taste. I should have said that of you. It means something more than mere taste. It's an attitude towards life. Handsome cab, 1066 and all that. Handsome? I have the courage of my convictions. Have you enjoyed your ride? was a novelty. You know, I was most terribly disappointed none of my friends passed in a car to see us. No doubt you're wondering why I surrounded myself with an atmosphere of the past. It's not exactly what you think, Vivian. Most people think they were born before their time. I'm after mine. Everybody wants to belong to the future. Nobody wants to belong to the past. Except me. And perhaps you, Vivian, will sometimes. I hope you like this. You know, you mustn't think that. I belong neither to the past nor the future. I'm up to the minute, neither a second behind nor beyond it. The present. Whether you like it or not, we're all products of the past. Even the present you think you belong to will soon become the past. We don't know if the future will be good or bad, but we gamble on it. And I've given up gambling. I prefer a certainty. The past. Tell me something. Remember you said after our little waltz that you dared not come too soon. That you mustn't stay too long. What did all that mean? I've always found that whenever I'm very much attracted to anything or anybody, I always move very slowly in the opposite direction. You know, mentally I pushed back that curtain of the nightclub many times before I actually went there again. Though it was difficult to keep away. Chance was worth taking. What chance? The chance that you might be interested. Some more wine. Only interested? Interested at first. I'm going to set out to charm you. Lots of men have tried that. It's my form of seduction, if you like. Strange. No man of any shape or kind I've yet met has ever suggested charm as his entire plan of campaign. Very well. Charm me. You don't understand me. 
I mean my ideas, my way of looking at things, my attitude towards life. Well, that's a new approach. Don't you like this one? Oh. All right, show me around. Show me your studio. I don't paint anymore. Why not? Have you noticed this? It should interest you. Do you recognize it? I'm ashamed. Should I? Is it so famous? It's a mirror. Has it a special significance? Only for me, Miss Bainwright. I'd like you to have it. Oh, no, I couldn't. Please. I couldn't. If you give me a particular pleasure, I'd accept it. What you put in that wine you gave me? I swear I've just seen a white cat in the mirror. Cat? Nonsense. I did. There. Get out. Get out. Get out. What a lovely cat. I do apologize. I'm. I'm afraid I. Well, I really must be going. I promised to have an early night, and it's getting rather late. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I really did. Please don't go yet. It's not very, very late. Then have another glass of wine. Well, maybe. Perhaps it is a little late. I'll get you your clothes. You'll be interested, I hope. Yes. Enormously. Enormously. I'm glad. I wanted to call it. The natives couldn't pronounce it, so they gave it their own name, Devil Girl. Particularly suitable. Now, you're prejudiced in her favor because she's your daughter. The David Conway, the overindulgent father. I wonder what the quivering prisoner at the bar who thinks I've got the hardest heart on the bench would think if he could see me as I am. Well, she certainly keeps the most fantastic hours. You know, sir, it's none of my business, but don't you think this nightclub life's rather bad for a young girl? Well, let me put it this way. The gawky schoolgirl that you remember has turned into something of a beauty. Just then. I said, that's rather a fine peak. Why, I'm not really worried about her. The young people she runs around with are all like her. There's marking time waiting for something to happen to them. Yeah, end of film. And so we say farewell. Oh. Marie. My dear girl. Well, say something. Preferably something about me. Well, four years in the wilds hasn't exactly improved my small talk. Well, have I changed? Said she expecting the answer, yes. No. You still have a brace on your teeth. I can't see your legs, but I expect you're still not need. And quite honestly, between you and me, your nose is still very shiny. Oh, you beast. You're probably right. Well, go on talking about your life in the wilds or the bush or wherever it was. Well, I'm home for a short time, then away for a couple of years. I think that's all. Why do grown men do these things? To get away from young women and write poems. Now, I've still got that one about love and dove you've knocked up. Terrifying, quite terrifying. But flattering, quite flattering. How do you turn this infernal thing off, Owen? Yeah, probably unorthodox, but effective. If you don't mind, I'll leave the infernal machine for the morning, sir. Of course, good night, Owen. Good night. Nice of you to have looked at your nurse first. I'll see you to the door. I hope we're going to see a lot of each other. That'll be lovely. Good night, Owen. Good night, madame. I want a word with you, young woman. Quite a bit tired, David. Can I wait? No. Come here. Come here. What red thing you've got on around your neck? Now, David, this is not the quivering prisoner at the bar. This is your spoiled beauty of a daughter. Remember her? Now, stop being foolish. I want to look at it. Here. You weren't wearing this when you went out this evening? He came tonight. Ah. This is a priceless piece of Renaissance work. You can't go accepting valuable presents like this. Who is this man, anyway? Oh, someone I met at a nightclub weeks ago. Ties crooked. You ought to have got over it by this time. 
Your affairs don't usually last as long as this. No. This is something different. I find him attractive, David. Madly attractive. Don't ask me anymore. This is my own secret. For the moment. It only matters that I'm the chosen companion of the most extraordinary man in the whole of London. Possibly in the whole world. All right, Miss Anway. You shall keep your secret. But you won't keep this. You shall take this back tomorrow. To your... Uh, your most extraordinary man in the whole of London. Stop joking. Where are you? Paul?
very beautiful. But this is hardly in character. Now we must do the finishing touches. The jewelry is missing, so is the headdress. How wonderful. Mind this I've been collecting them over a period of years, but just for this occasion. Oh. Surprising how it fits me. It isn't surprising at all. In the future you'll find all the matching jewelry in the office of classes. The moment I enter this house, I can't help feeling that I've left the other Mervan way back at the nightclub. This one is someone entirely different. You are someone entirely different. beginning to think like him, speak like him, feel like him. Paul was turning me into someone I couldn't understand. The weeks passed, he took up all my time and energy. And yet, there was never any undue pressure in Paul's hold over me. All day long, there was a sensation of being imprisoned in a different world. It was as if I wanted to get away and couldn't. Even in my sleep, he would be there in the corridor of mirrors, watching me dressing up for him. I was becoming like a wax doll, all head and shoulders. What's in the letter, Caro? Since you're so anxious to tell me, and it is addressed to me, what's in it? Since you're so anxious to know, your favorite client, Mr. Paul Mangum, is giving a ball, a masked fancy dress ball, next month. Here. He wants you to make him a particular dress for a lady, the design's enclosed. It could be for a Miss Mafanway Conway. Could be. That man knows what he wants. These are quite perfect. She hasn't been seen at the club now for some time, has she? Neither is he, my pet. Do you think I have noticed the look in your eyes whenever he's around? It makes me sick. I could always tell the moment he came into the club. Even your voice would take on a hungry note, like a yowling cat on the tiles. Tell me, Edgar, if you hate him so much, why have you slaved on these dresses all these years? Why do you crawl to him? Why do you lick his boots? Or maybe that's become a habit, hmm? The reason is simple, my pet. I am an artist. He appreciates my artistry and pays well for it. Hello? Oh, all right, show him up quickly. Yes, quickly. If I'm not too early. Oh, no, Mr. Mangan. I'm at your service at any time of the day. I received your designs. They're quite perfect. But in Asia, probably thought so many original to design them. I want all these costumes kept in the same style. In Venetian school. I'll leave the choice of materials to you. That's your affair, but they must be kept simple. May I make a few suggestions? I'm still here, you know. I beg your pardon, I didn't see you. There was a time when you first came to the club, when you couldn't look at anyone else. I wasn't looking at you, my dear. I was merely interested in the play of light on your red hair. 
and amazed at the vulgarity of an age that can produce such a type as yours. This fancy dress ball of yours. I'm looking forward to it. I'm afraid only my friends are invited. Mr. Mangan, perhaps you care to look at this fig of velvet. Oh, Edgar. I was just trying to explain to Mr. Mangan that the costumes might not be ready in time, unless... Is that also your condition, Orson? Yes. Sorry, Mr. Mangan. I'd arrange to have the costume sent for. Who put that on? Must be the young lady, sir. She asked me not to tell you she'd arrived. I think she wanted to be a little surprised for you. Do you need me again tonight, sir? No, you can go, Mortimer. I'll see the lady home. Does me good to see you so happy, sir. I haven't seen you like this since Italy, the day you bought the picture home. That's ten years ago, Mortimer. It's a long time. Yes, it is a long time, sir. Perhaps this might be the right moment to ask sir, how much longer I've got to wear these fancy clothes. I'm getting a little tired of the way the tradespeople keep laughing at me. And even the girl in the grocer's calls me Mr. Pickwick. To be honored, Mortimer. Pickwick was Dickens' favorite character. Pickwick. Dancing, don't you? Well, I've got something here that might interest you. I've arranged the ball especially for you. You'll be able to dance all night long. And I've invited all the most famous and infamous people in London. Oh, how wonderful. For me? How did they all come? They'll come all right, if only out of curiosity. For one night, you and I will be in our proper setting. Venice, 400 years ago. Mind your dress. I have another little piece of canal that goes to my grounds. Mm -hmm. oh, there it is, the Grand Canal. The dancing, the ballet, Lady Delarte. But a detail will be missing from the age to which you really belong. That should make you happy, Miss Henry. And what have you chosen for me to wear? I'll tell you about that after dinner. One day you realize how much. Still raining? I'm afraid it is. Mortimer isn't back yet. Paul, would you consider it very 20th century if I invited myself for the night? I'm really awfully tired. Have you a guest room? I have, but I'm afraid I can't supply the chaperone. You hate to answer the door to an irate father shouting for my blood. That is on holiday in Wales. Good. I have a horror of bloodshed, especially my own.
No one's been in this room before. It was waiting for you. Down, Miss Van Wyck. You know my name. Oh yes, I know everything about you. Naughty, naughty Blanchette. This time you've given me away. So whenever I saw the cat, you were near. Oh yes. Many were the times I wished that I could talk to you. You wondered how I knew your name. I heard him say it. It sounds beautiful from his lips. I don't understand. Paul told me there was nobody else in the house. For him, there is no one. You'll have some tea. But you had many opportunities of talking to me when I was alone. But how could I know that he wouldn't suddenly appear? You know how he can appear quite suddenly from nowhere. But I can always watch you without his knowing. 
I have a way of flitting from room to room and about the corridors, like a ghost. Sugar. Very often I thought that you would discover me. What would happen if Paul were to find out you'd spoken to me? He would throw me out. What's he afraid of? How old do you think I am? The truth now. About 50? That's what he's afraid of. That you might find out why a woman of 30 should look like me. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, but you must. You don't want to become like me, do you? Listen, he found me in Italy during the war. I'd lost my home and my family. I was very beautiful. He was very rich. He said that I was what he'd been searching for. He promised that I should be the mistress of this house. That I should never want for anything. That I should have all the clothes and jewels that I wanted to wear. I did. Every day I was dressed up in them. He never allowed me to go outside the house because, he said, it would spoil the illusion. And then... he got tired of me. I was banished below stairs. You could have run away and left him. For years, I've been a prisoner in this house. I didn't know a soul. Since that time, there's been a long procession of girls. But I always warn them in time. You think he loves you, don't you? He loves only himself. It isn't true. It isn't true. Paul didn't force me. I came and stayed of my own free will. Of his will. He's clever. He makes you think it is your own. He's like a drug. He makes you see life his way. And you've got to go on. Because if you stopped, you'd find the world so cruel and ugly that you'd have to go crawling back to him again. No, 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 no! see life his way. There's been a long procession. Where's my room? So my back to him again. designs for the musician's costumes. I found them in this old book. Oh. Is it true about the other girls? Did they also have black hair like mine? Did you dress them out as well? So Veronica's been talking to you. So it is true. Everything you tell me is true. You have no hold over me. What are you talking about, Lavenna? You have no hold over me. You can't make me become like her, or a slave like all the others. See, you can't deny anything. I've seen how she looks. I thought she was an old woman. That's why you kept her hidden, because you made her what she is. She looked as she does now when Mortimer first found her in the street. She 
She's a poor creature with the mind of a child. Don't lie to me. You know you found in Italy. She doesn't sound mad at all. She's afraid of you, Miss Andrew, as a child would be afraid. Her obsession is that if you're coming here, she will be turned out. Why should she be afraid of me? She also warned the others. There were no others. I don't believe you. Aren't I almost a prisoner? You've done everything you could to keep me away from other people. I was afraid of losing you. Because you're the one I was waiting for. Afraid of losing me? So, in his untiring quest, the well-known connoisseur, Paul Mangan, discovered her in a rather expensive curio shop, took her home, and found that she was the exact shape, colouring, and measurements to fit his unique collection of costumes. But this marionette's got tired of the role before you got tired of her. Paul, I don't intend becoming one of those dolls in your cupboards. I'm getting out of this toy shop. Wait! The well, well, I've no power to hold you. What I'm going to tell you may seem puzzling and strange to you. You may wonder why I haven't told you before. You're young, and I wanted to be sure that you're ready to accept a miracle. I don't believe in miracles. Don't you, Miss Henry? And what's this? Wonderful. Why did you do this with me? Portrait of a lady attributed to Cristobano Alori, 1486. Don't understand. I was in a castle in Italy after the last war, wounded with a shell splinter in my head. All the times I lay in bed, she looked down at me. For nights I dreamt about her. She filled my imagination. After the war, I went back to England. But I found no peace and no happiness. That girl's face haunted me. She drew me back to Italy. I had to possess her. And the day I bought her, an infinite peace and happiness enveloped me for the first time in my life. I was determined to find out who she was. I let me search through the archives of the castle, then I discovered her name. Venetia. Then something very strange happened. I became conscious of knowing events in her life before I'd even read about them. I felt that somehow, somewhere, I'd known her before. That mirror in her hand, I felt I'd given it to her myself. I've always laughed at the idea of reincarnation. But this had happened to me. So I was bound to believe it. By now, I was convinced that I had lived 400 years ago. That I had been Venetia's lover. You're poor Mangan, living here and now. How could you believe that you're that man? Yes, how could I believe? One part of the puzzle was missing. And that part was me. You believe that I'm that girl. The smile. It's mocking. It's cruel. Yes, I always hated her smile. I wonder what she was thinking. She was cruel. She was faithless. I could have changed her. But she left me. Speak as if you were really there. As if? I was there, I tell you. I was there. This time you won't leave me, Venetia. No. I won't leave you. Eighty-six. No, Paul. I won't leave you. so much Paul who frightened me, but what I knew was happening 
to me. And most of all, I wanted to be able to laugh again. for a few days, but I've got to go back. Disappointing, even for a few days. Perhaps it's because of you I've got to go back. I can't explain it. It wouldn't make sense. Nothing you do say makes much sense. You see, I could never marry someone with the shadow of another man always beside me. With the shadow? You were sure you were right the other day when you said a thousand times I'm never in love. It's always so difficult to explain, isn't it? Perhaps I should have said I never loved anyone before. done all this for that woman. You ought to know, dear Edgar. You made the dress. Well, it's getting late and I haven't seen it anywhere. Don't worry, you will. Even if, according to the chapter, Mr. Fanway Conway is spending the past holiday in Wales with the ever so eligible Mr. Owen Reese, the distinguished explorer. So I doubt if Paul Mangan reads the chapter. Then don't you think, dear Edgar, someone should tell him?
Harlow call. Looking for someone? Do I recognize my sister, Look, Rachel Borgia? Is that intended as a compliment? Just as you like. She's as handsome as you are, Caroline, and just about as dangerous. Mm. And what do I do to live up to her reputation? Start off by poisoning a dozen lovers or so. Lead me to the bar. I'll start at once. I'm afraid you'd have to look elsewhere for your first victim. Lovely costume, Mortimer. Yes. I'm afraid I make more noise than a ruddy fire engine. Begging your pardon, Miss. I should have one of those, if I I never take it, sir. Something they'll never forget, Paul. Until some bright young thing comes along and shows them something even more amusing. But you remember, won't you? Yes. I remember. It's getting rather cold. Let's go inside.
for that. Give me a hand. Whatever for? It's an engagement ring. You don't like it? How very amusing. It's awfully cute. But it's just like hers, don't you see? It's just like hers. Oh, for goodness sake, Paul. Stop this nonsense. The springing of something of the present back into the past, or the past back into the present, whichever way you put it. It's becoming a bit of a bore. Got a cigarette? I'm absolutely panting for one. Oh, I'm forgetting. We don't smoke, do we? What's the matter with you? Nothing. It's just that I have the courage to tell you the truth at last. You set out to charm me, as you put it. Well, you succeeded. I was attracted to you. I like dressing up. What woman doesn't? I was in the mood. It was a novelty. You played up to my vanity. Yes, of course. It was my vanity which made me take part in all this madness. But when you showed me the picture of this woman and told me that I was her, then things became a bit too complicated, Paul. So I went away for a rest cure. Why did you come here tonight? Curiosity. That was all. I'm relieved. <laughs> Clem doesn't have to because I was here. <laughs> Clem doesn't can't have a part of each other. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but really, just because you're dressed up as a Borgia doesn't make me Venetia. Look, ours was a very charming, unique affair. That was all. I never intended anything serious. I love someone else. I'm going to marry him. So you laughed when I told you my story. You thought it was very funny. And she laughed too. I should have known that four centuries can't change a woman's soul. A pity, me, Henry, that you inherited not only her beautiful body, but also her worthless heart. All right, Paul. I'm Venetia, heart and all. Didn't you say she went off with another man? See? We've both completed the full cycle of our destinies. Not quite. I didn't tell you the end of her story, as I hoped yours might be different. But it's not going to be, Miss Vanley. Not going to be. You see, he loved her hair. It was so dark and mysterious. He strangled her with it. Do I still make you laugh, Miss Vanley? I still make you laugh, my Venue.
so disappointed. Aren't you glad to see me? Why haven't you gone home? Yes, I know. I'm completely plastered. In fact, I nearly passed right out. <laughs> oh, don't let that little society bit get you down. I love you. Do you hear? You've always treated me like dirt. Well, I am a tramp, but I like it. Don't look at her. Look at me. You never said a kind word to me. You despise me. I suppose you think I'm not good enough for you. Caroline. Why did you do it, Mr. Mangan? Why did you do it, Mr. Mangan? Veronica, would you tell the gentleman I shall be ready in five minutes for them to take me away? Yes, Mr. Mangan.
five minutes, miss. Why have you come? Paul, let me tell them. There's nothing to tell. Yes, there is. About you and me and Venetia. That must never be told. It would help to save you. For what? Lunatic asylum? Can you imagine me in a padded cell? I, who have always surrounded myself with beautiful things. Jewels, pictures, sound of music, the touch of a woman's hair. Sorry, not quite the most tactful thing to imagine. Don't you want to live? Do you love me, Mavanna? And there's no need for me to defend myself. You see, before I was searching for someone, I know I must have seemed mad and frightening to you. But have you ever thought that everyone, from the very minute he's born, is searching for something? Most people die without even knowing what it is. I knew. So I'm one of the lucky ones. All sorts of people before me have tried to live outside their time. It's quite futile. There is a time to be born and a time to die. So please don't spoil the exit I've chosen for myself. You ought to know I always had a liking for dramatic effects. You are charged that on the 9th of September the 3rd, 1938, you willfully murdered Caroline Hart. Under this indictment, what do you plead? Guilty, my lord. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. My lords, the king's justices, do strictly charge and command all persons to keep silence while sentence of death is passing on the prisoner at the bar upon pain of imprisonment. God save the king. The sentence of the court upon you is that you be taken from this place to a lawful prison, thence to a place of execution. That you there be hanged by the neck until you be dead, and that your body be afterwards bedded within the precincts of the prison in which you have been confined before your execution. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Amen. <laughs> Ball murderers strangled Caroline up with her own hair. Executed October. Oh, yes, I remember reading about that in the News of the World. Good afternoon, Miss. Mortimer. Not quite as we knew him, is it? So it was you who sent the telegram? Yes, Miss. Uh, Madam. You see, I discovered Veronica had found out your address and was writing those threatening letters you've been getting. Veronica? Madam, do you believe he did it? No. Not always. Mortimer, why should Veronica now wish to blackmail me? That is why I sent for you. Veronica's always been a little queer, madam. She was like that when I found her and brought her home. From Italy? Oh, no, that was her story. He realized that she was mad and it wasn't safe for her to be out alone. 
But lately she's got worse. She is mad, dangerously mad. I sent you the telegram because I was afraid that you might take action against Veronica. And the poor master's name would be dragged through the mud again. Oh, madam, I, I wanted to implore you not to do that. Because I'm having Veronica put away. Yes, I'm having her put away. He never wished that, but... Every evening, just as it's getting dark, she disappears. A few days ago, I followed her here. Always at the same time. Just as this place is going to close. She wants to have a few words with him alone. Hello, gentlemen. There she is now. I'm late, Paul. We haven't much time. That old fool, he will keep spying on me. He pretends she's not in the house. But I know she's there. I hear her every night laughing and dancing in the corridor. I hear the music box play. Last night, I went after her. But she fled and hid in the guest room. She knows I'm frightened of going there. But one night, I won't be. I couldn't see the last time. It was too dark. I couldn't see she had red hair. It was the one with the black hair I wanted. She's here, Paul. The one with the black hair. She still uses the same scent. so that you couldn't tell him. Where are you? You won't find me, Veronica. You won't be writing any more letters to me. Veronica. Soon yours will be one of them. Look at your own handiwork. Where are you? You say you loved him, but you've turned him into an effigy of horror and wax. No good running away, Veronica. No good running away.
I'll see to everything. What am I? Please, miss. The master would wish it. busy time, darling. I spent much more than I ought to have done. I bought you a new dressing gown to match mine. Thank you, darling. How are the children being good? How's the garden? The tulips out yet? Well, darling, you haven't been away a year, you know. I went into Madame Tussauds. Really? You know? They've got four men down there. The man who strangled a woman with her hair. Funny you should mention that. There's something about him in the paper this morning. He didn't do it at all. His old housekeeper confessed just before she died. She'd thrown herself in front of a lorry or something. Well, you were lucky to have seen him. I expect they'll take him out of Tussauds now. He will? He must have been a very attractive person. Didn't you think so, Miss Amber? <laughs> 